So let's see what happens. All right, so everybody, let's, this, let's do a little bit of a, of a brief reminder uh, about composites and how all that stuff plays out, okay? So um, this could take a long time, so I, I really have to be a little cautious that I don't oversell it. But let's imagine that we had just a couple of functions. The first one being f of x is, let's say, 3x minus 1 over 5x plus uh, 2. Simple little idea. And let's imagine we had g of x was the square root of x minus 4. And, um, and maybe one more, let's make it h of x is equal to uh, 2x plus 8. Not that that's particularly significant, those, what, what I picked, it's just the concept. So for starters, let's see if you guys know how to find h of g of 8. Do you guys know what that means? h of g of 8. So it's like an h where x is Right, so the first thing we're gonna do is go find g of eight. And that would be eight minus four, which is four. Square root of that is two. Now, again, I know in some classes they would say, I want you to show your work. To me, that is showing my work. I realized I wanted to go in there and do that. So I don't need you to write the root and all that kind of stuff, think through it. Now, of course, if you made a careless mistake, bummer. That's not, you know, it's gonna be hard to see. And then what do I do with this answer right here? Yeah, I'm going to plug that back into H itself, which was this guy right here, which is 2 times 2 plus 8, or in other words, so not that big of a deal, right? You guys cool with that? So when you have numbers, it's not that hard. Sometimes when you have letters, it gets a little bit harder. I'm going to leave this one for a moment. I, I am going to get to your question here, um, right in this spot right here. So now let's, let's change the story a little bit more and say, how about if we did f of h of x? Now that's a little strange because what it's saying is let's take f of, but instead of plugging a number in, it's saying let's plug h in where that number was. So here's f. f was 3x minus 1 over 5x plus 2, right? But what am I going to put where those holes were, where x used to be? I'm going to put all of h, which is this guy right here. And then we're going to do a little bit of quick simplification, which would give me 6x's. There's 24 here minus 1. And I know some of you guys are going to probably go a little slower than I do on that, but I just got to go quick because I have a whole lesson to hit. And then I got 10x here. I got a 40 and a 2, so it's 42. You guys all right there? Now, the question that you asked was about domain. And so that's what I wanted to do a couple, make sure we got this and then we'll talk domain. Well, with that, that's, yeah, I'm done. That's, I can't do anything more with that. Now, what a lot of people wanna do is they wanna start canceling things out. You gotta be super duper careful and not everybody understands this, but why in a problem does like two and negative two cancel each other out is because they're technically called inverses of each other. They're called additive inverses. What does two and negative two do to each other? They cancel because one is the complete opposite of the other and it makes zero, right? Why does three times one third go away? Again, those are multiplicative inverses. They're flipped over. When you multiply, you get one, right? So what happens in a problem like this, I frequently see people want to cancel the six and the 10 and make it a three fifths. But division is the opposite of multiplication. And right now, there's not a multiplication in this story. That's why when your teachers tell you to factor all the time, hey, factor that thing, let's factor that. When you factor, you're turning the story into a product. You're turning it into a multiplication story. And once you have that multiplication story, now you can divide and make things better. So I am done with this because if you look on top, I can't factor it. There's nothing that they have in common. I'm kind of stuck. So as far as the domain goes, x would not be negative 42 over 10. Or in other words, negative 21 over 5. Why not those, why not that? That would put zero on the bottom, which is never allowed. 
Now let's go look at one more thing. I told you back during this lesson, and I know most of you were not even here at that time, not only do we look at the final answer, we're supposed to look at the inside function h. And we're supposed to consider, does h bring anything to the domain itself? So the two things we don't want to do is we don't want to divide by zero. Is there any division inside of h itself? No, so I don't worry about that. And then we also don't want to take any square roots of negatives. Is there a square root? Yeah. Right here? Okay, so I, it's not that I'm ignoring it, I just considered it and there was no additional restrictions to the domain that I have to worry about, so I'm good to go. Okay, now let's go ahead and make this a little bit harder. So this is the one that I actually wanted to make sure that we could handle today. This one is a little harder. G of H. Now again, here is G. And for those of you that are just kind of like watching and getting it, there, this, is, this has got some stuff to it. So I'm supposed to take this thing where X used to be, and I'm supposed to replace it with, I messed that up. I wanted it to use, sorry about that, everybody. I wanted this to be F. This is the one I wanted. So I'm going to fix that. I'm going to put F right here. Sorry about that. Um, but that's the, that's the problem I'm worried about. Now, let me ask you a question. Domain, am I worried about dividing by zero? Could that happen in this story? Yeah, I got a fraction, absolutely. Is it possible that somehow when I take this fraction and I subtract four, I could get a negative? But I honestly would be at a loss on how to find out how this thing could be determined to be negative or positive as it stands right now. I literally have, no, I, I honestly couldn't tell you how to do it. So I need to change what it looks like. So this is my first step. The next step, and this is the important part right here, is I'm going to create a common denominator by giving this a 5x plus 2 up and down. This is a topic that I know you guys did in Algebra 2 where you talked about um, simplifying rational expressions. You did a lot of that where you tried to put things together and you multiplied and factored and did all of that. Well, some of that was preparing you for this. So let's just count this up real careful. How many X's do you see? I see three X's here and I see negative 20 X's here. What do you have? Negative 17 of them. I see a negative one here and I see a negative eight here for a total of negative nine. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I did not know how to do the answer before, but I do now. So let's go ahead and let's find that domain. By the way, I am done with this question right now. This is the composite. I'm done. But let's see what happens. Let's go over here. What number would make zero happen in the bottom? Got it. And I'm gonna put then an open circle there indicating do not touch that value. Can I get close to it? Yeah. Yeah, as long as I don't do it, that's all right. Okay, here's the tricky part. I'm gonna look on top and that's 9 seventeenths. That's a little bit obnoxious, 9 seventeenths, and that's where zero would happen. Now the theme there is although I can take the square root of zero, what is zero right next to? Nope, one is not a problem for me. It's next to negative. Think about on the number line, what is zero right next to? Negatives, right? What happens if I take the square root of a negative? It doesn't work. So if you're standing at 9 17 you're right at zero. And if you step the wrong way, you're in the abyss. You're in the bad area, aren't you? So even though zero itself is good, it's right next to bad things. So it's really important to know where that dividing line is, right? So what would happen, everybody? This is a little tricky question because just when I made it up, it turned out some negatives. It's all right. So give me a number to the right of 9 17 Now I understand 9 17 is a kind of an obnoxious number. Two, sure. Now if I plugged in two, I get negative 34 minus nine is like negative 43 or something like that. And you said two? So five times two is 10 plus two is, oh, that's two. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, that's positive. So when you gave me the number two and I tried it, I got a negative on top and a positive on the bottom. Am I allowed to do that? Look at it. Can I take the square root of that quotient? No, what just happened? 
a negative over a positive is a, yeah, I don't want to do that. That's bad. Give me a number in the middle. And this is going to be the obvious number that you want to pick in the, I feel like, did I mess that up? Nine seventeenths. Oh, I did mess it up. Nobody called me on it. This should be negative nine seventeenths. And I got to think about that a little bit. I think I have that backwards. Hmm. Hmm. Negative nine seventeenths is about negative point five three. So I'm going to have to put that over here. Yeah, I was messing up royal. Shoot. Okay. Sorry about that. That's going to be a little bit hard, but it turns out negative a half is a pretty good number. So it's right in the middle of here. So negative a half. Now what happens if I try negative a half, what happens is the top is negative and the bottom is negative. What do you guys think? Can I do that? What's a negative over a negative? Yay, that works. And then when I go really far to the left and, and, and honestly, I just am very flippant about these. You guys always want to pick this number that's really, really close right here. I say, give me a number to the left of negative 9 17 I say negative 100. And the thing is, is if you pick negative 100, the numerator is definitely positive, right? Isn't negative 17 times negative 100 going to be a large positive number? How about five times that 100? It's going to be a big Five times negative 100 is going to be a big negative. That's going to be a no as well. The only place this problem can be is smack dab in the middle. That's it. So if you graph this, that's all you would see in this composite function. Now, as far as today goes, and I got to make sure that I leave ourselves enough time. So this is a 1.5. We're going to start talking about inverses. So, um, what, what, what is going to happen with an inverse is I would like to, and I do know that, that some of you have done this. In fact, if you did what you were supposed to do and you actually did your distance learning at the end of last year, you have seen some of this. If you chose not to, I get it, but that means it's going to be harder for you because you didn't do this. And I know it was actually taught. So what an inverse does, see, what does the two do to the negative two is it cancels it out and it makes it like it never happened, right? So what an inverse does in mathematics is it takes the two values and swaps them. So if you have an inverse and if you have a function where say you plugged in two and you got nine, you know what the inverse does? If two gives you nine in the inverse, if you plug in nine, it gives you two. It's this perfect little like magic trick that does it. In fact, have you guys ever been in a situation where somebody says, okay, I want you to imagine a number and then you do a whole bunch of stuff to it and they tell you all these little cool things to do like multiply it by your age and then let's do this and then let's add the month that you're born and they do all these crazy things and at the end they tell you your number back. Mathematically, they made an inverse. They made it to where somewhere in the story you have to give them some information and that information tells them the actual answer because it's an inverse. They're going to do something where the question gives the answer, therefore the answer gives back that original question. That's just how they play. So there's a set of rules for inverses. Hopefully this is gonna make good sense over time when I get there, but here are the rules for this whole story. First, you're gonna swap X and Y. Now remember I said two gives you nine, therefore nine gives you two. So notice what I'm doing to X and Y. I'm switching them, cool? Very simple thing to do. So the first thing that you do every single time when you take a look at an inverse is you take the X and the Y and you just do a little reversal. Boom, done. Step two, try if you can to isolate Y. Normally in equations, that's what we like to have by itself, don't we? We like Y equals MX plus B. We don't like two X equals three Y minus one. That's what we wanna do. Now, Number three and number four, I'm going to go ahead and write it in. But we'll talk about these things in a second. And uh, hopefully this is all going to play out in our favor reasonably well. Yes, yeah, Sophie. Isolate Y. Isolate Y. 
So let's start off with the easiest thing that you guys know how to do, okay? The easiest function you guys know how to handle is lines, isn't it? Those are pretty dang easy. So let's say we started with a simple function, y equals, or f of x equals, um, let's give me a, a, what's a nice simple slope? Like really easy. 2x, I love it. 2x minus 11. Simple, right? I don't think that's gonna blow anybody away. So right now, what is happening to x? Something is multiplying it by two and then subtracting 11. So what would be the inverses of multiplying by two and subtracting 11? These are the building blocks that I'm gonna see in this inverse. I'm gonna see an add by 11, not down by two, one half. See, the inverse of multiplying it by two is gonna be cutting it in half or dividing it by two, if you will, okay? So if I did it right, I should see some kind of an add 11 in there somewhere and some kind of a cut in half somewhere as well. So let's see what happens. So my first story was supposed to be swap X and Y. Now that wasn't very hard. In fact, the first step, nobody ever struggles with. Everybody's like, got that one, that was easy. Because remember, my son's like, oh, dad, why do they call it f of x? That scares me. Why don't we just call it y? It's okay. Who cares? Move on. Now what? How? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's back up a little bit. Let's back up a little bit. Should I divide by two? No, let's add that 11 first. Now what? Divide by two, let's do that. So x plus 11 over two would be that new y. So now I, what I told you is somehow, by the way, this is part of the story of checking your answers. Now, what I wanna do is, if, have you ever watched Mythbusters? Have anybody ever watched Mythbusters? I love what they do almost all the time is they go through a story and they don't say they prove that it's true, they say it's plausible. Because when you tr prove something is true, how often must it work? All the time. So how often should these two things be the exact opposites of each other is an infinite number of times. Well, that's gonna be hard to show, isn't it? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for, when I say check, I'm gonna look for plausibility. So Sophie, can you give me a number, a simple number for X? Four, I like it. So if I plugged in four right here into the original problem, let's go up to the original. What is two times four? eight, and eight take away 11 is negative three, okay? That's so, let's see if this is plausible. This does not prove it. This just shows that it's plausible. Let's see what happens down here then if I plug negative three into the inverse. What is negative three plus 11? Eight, and eight divided by two is, did it do what I wanted it to do? Now that does not mean that it is definitively correct, but it feels plausible. You guys understand the kind of language I'm giving you. Now, here's the interesting thing. I hated this when I was in high school because of the letters that are there. Um, and let, me, let me give you one more little piece right here. This is actually a little bit of notation. Again, I wish I had not, I wish that the math had not pick this particular notation uh, because we have used negative one in the past to represent a reciprocal of something that flips stuff over. This is not that. If you put the specifically, you put the negative one on F right there, that's the symbol they borrowed from reciprocals, but it's not a reciprocal. It says it's an inverse. So I'm saying that this is the snake bite. This is the antivenom. You with me? It's just gonna reverse the process and bring us home. So here's my question. What should happen if I did something like this? What do you guys think should happen if I do that? I plug seven into one, get an answer, take that answer, plug it into the other. What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to completely unravel each other, weren't they? What should f of f inverse of negative 16 give me? Negative 
16. Now, by the way, should, could you check that? Yeah, in fact, we kind of did. Look what happened. We plugged in four and it gave me negative three. I plugged in negative three and it gave me that four back. Did we just do that very problem right here? We actually did, it's kind of cool. So I hate that this is how math does it. I'm gonna go all the way to the proof right here. What is F of F inverse of X then? See, if it was seven, I got seven. If it was negative 16, it was negative 16. If it's X, what should it be? X. Now here's the benefit. See, seven gives me seven. Negative 16 gives me negative 16. So whatever I plug in, what should happen? I should get the same thing. This is the strong one because X is a variable, isn't it? So what could X be? Literally anything. If I could show that no matter what X is, I get X back, how many problems have I shown then is all of them. That's called a proof, everybody. I literally in one step have shown an infinite number of examples. I've literally shown every example because what could X be? Anything. So let's see that. Let's take F of F inverse of X and let's see F of F inverse of X. So this is one of the reasons um, when, when Emily asked that question earlier, I wanted to go over that idea is here is F of x, isn't it? Was that f of x? Are you guys okay with that? And then we put f inverse in here. Now, what I hope, if I have done it right, you guys know the answer already. We know we're looking for an x. So tell me, what do you see right away in the simplification that I could do? Could we cancel the twos right there? There's a divide by two and a times two right there. Would those cancel out? And I have X plus 11 minus 11. Did that in fact give me X? So guys, in this particular situation, now I look at the problem and it's not that I think I did it right. I know I did it right. I was perfect in that story. Now I'm gonna go ahead and show you a picture. And so, um, uh, Perrin, I'd really like to make sure you're, you're watching some of this and I know what you're doing and you're good, but um, let's see if I could stop this and do a new share. Uh, let's share screen and let's do it to this thing right here. Um, this is a little strange, so I will hopefully help you make this make sense. But if f of x is my function originally, 2x minus 11, and my new one, and unfortunately with Desmos, I can't call it F inverse of X. So I'm just gonna use the letter G, knowing that that is the inverse. I had, what was it, X plus 11 over two. There may be a little bit of um, something in here that is gonna be a little bit deceptive because the screen may not be perfectly square, which is unfortunate. Um, but this is the inverse, okay? Well, what happens is there is a special line y equals x that cuts through the whole story. And not at all obvious, but what happens is every time you have an inverse, one graph is the other graph flipped across that line. So if you flip this across the line and we picked a point like, let's say, uh, the, the one we did, four comma negative three on the original graph, which was the red graph. Probably be smarter if I labeled that red so we could see it. What's gonna show up then on the new graph is negative three comma four, which is now on the blue graph. My cursor is just disappearing, not easy to see. Boom, what do you guys see about those is you see how they're exactly flipped over from that diagonal line. That's kind of an important little picture, okay? So what I would like you guys to try, let's go ahead and do a, a, a new share back to the doc cam. I'd like to see if you guys could try this one yourself right here, number two. I'm gonna give you the function g of x and this time, I think what I want to do is I want to give you um, two-thirds x minus five. 
And let's see if you guys can swap X and Y and do whatever it takes to solve for Y. And you may get a slightly different looking answer than what I get, but let's see if we get the same thing in the bigger picture. And let's check for plausibility when we're done. All right, so when you guys isolate, you guys are really used to PEMDAS, aren't you? But believe it or not, when you try to isolate a variable as opposed to evaluate, when you evaluate, you plug in, you do PEMDAS. I can't have, actually say it backwards, it doesn't roll off the tongue, but actually when you try to isolate a variable, you do PEMDAS in reverse. That's what you're supposed to do. So what did I get rid of first? See, I got rid of the minus five. And then there's a multiply by two thirds. So how would I get rid of a multiply by two thirds? Yes, you got it. That, that, this everybody is my inverse of choice. And so if you picked a number again, and I would always say this is about, this would not prove it, but if I'm taking a test and it never said prove it, I don't have to prove it. If I have the time, if I finish my test and I got 20 minutes left, is it worth proving it and make sure it, I did it right? Yeah, but honestly, a lot of times if you're like, man, I'm only on problem number two, I'm not sure if I'm gonna run out of time. Real quick, while I've got this thing in my mind, let's just make up a number. And, and so, because this has a two thirds in it, give me a number that's a multiple of three, that's gonna make life easier. Six, let's do that. So if I did two times six, that'd be 12, right? 12 over three is four, four minus five is negative one. So when I plugged in six, I got negative one, cool? If I did this right, what has to happen then in my inverse? Let's find out, did it actually work? This is a question mark. This does not prove it. But it tells me, by the way, the chances are that Austin's pick, this random number six, if that worked, I probably did right. You know, I mean, if you pick zero, I might doubt it a little bit because zero is too special. But, you know, whatever. What is negative one plus five? Four. Three times four is 12. And divide that by two, I got. Oh, hey. I think we did okay. Are you guys all right with this idea? And that would be the same line. These two lines would be flipped across that diagonal line y equals x. It's kind of a strange idea, but that brings me up to something that is what I needed to get to, is that unfortunately, because of that flipping idea, here's where I've got to slow the train down. Let's say this is my story, x squared minus four. Ooh, now I go in here and I swap X and Y, right? You guys okay so far? Uh oh, uh, I'm a little worried about something because that means if I did that and I started off with X squared minus four. By the way, I'm going to show you one of the biggest pitfalls in this entire class right here. It's something that I will hammer you all year long. And I guarantee you there's a couple of tests that you will hit 
where half of you will get docked on this particular point coming up. So I'm just letting you know these are the pitfalls. Taught it for a dang long time. Oh dear. When I go ahead and swap X and Y, it now says X is Y squared minus four. The blue graph is technically the inverse of the red graph. Do you guys see that? I swap X and Y. Do we have a problem? What is the problem about the blue graph right now? It's not a function. Shoot. But the rule says I have to flip the red graph across that dotted line, which means this portion of the graph, when I flip it over, becomes the top half. And the bottom half became from the left side. That's really weird. If I flip both of them over, it necessarily will fail the vertical line test. Dang. Well, you know why? If I made on the first one, if I made a line y equals 10, on the inverse, y equals 10, which is a horizontal line, would become x equals 10, which is a vertical line. So this is the new little thing that we need to add to the mix is the following. To be invertible, now that's a strange idea. In other words, to be invertible, that means for a function to be able to be taken the inverse of, it's like how, what, what makes it qualified to do that? A function must pass both must pass both the vertical line test. Now you guys are familiar with the vertical line test, right? And the horizontal line test. Did this function that I gave you, x squared minus four, a simple parabola, did it pass both tests? That's a problem. So here's what we do. What if I, I took this guy right here? Could I do anything to that original graph? Let's go back to it. Is there something I could do to that original red graph that would make it pass both tests? Well, if I go back to that original graph and I say, you know what? Okay, fine. I would like it to have this whole thing. But what if I said, I'm only going to allow it to be X to be greater than or equal to zero? What if I only take that side? Would that now be okay when I flip it over? See, now that it actually passes both the vertical and the horizontal line test, when I flip it over, it's gonna pass both tests. So I'm gonna finish this. Let's go back to here so you can see this. So we are going to have to change the domain a little bit. That's important. You have to know that sometimes you have to say, Ideally, I leave this thing be all reals, but it's got a problem. So I'm going to change it and say, oh, let's make the domain a little bit more strict so it'll fit. Let's add four to both sides. What would you guys do last? What's the last thing to get y all by itself? How do I get rid of that y squared? A square root. So my h inverse of x is the square root of x plus four. Oh, now let's go back here and let's look at this thing again. And instead of writing it this way, let's try y equals the square root of x plus four. Is it okay now? Ah, uh, I fixed it. So do you see the remnants of what we should see. The original problem had a square and a minus four. What does this one have? It has a root and a plus four. Would those, should those unravel each other? They should. Could I check my answer by plugging in some number like five comma 21 and therefore get 21 comma five? You guys with me on that? So <clears throat> this happens so frequently in math that they came up with a special term for it. Instead of mentioning both of these things right here, we call it one, two, one. 
If something is one to one, it means for every X, there's a Y, but every, for every Y, there's exactly one X. So the soda machine that I talked to you about earlier in the year, the where you'd have multiple buttons that could give you a, a water or give you a Gatorade, would not be a one-to-one -one function. If one button gives you an orange Gatorade, then there's literally only, only one button that can give you that orange Gatorade. It can't double up because this says one, two, one. There has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between those. So let's go a little bit further. Now imagine we changed our world a little bit and gave you j of x is equal to three parentheses x minus four quantity squared plus two. Oh man, that's a parabola too. Is this going to pass the horizontal line test as it starts? Dang. So I know from my experience in algebra two that this particular problem has a vertex at four two. So I know it's going to fail the horizontal line test. It is not right now one-to-one. -one. So what am I going to do to fix it? I'm going to throw away this side of the graph because if I throw away the left side of the graph, will it now be one-to-one? -one? Does it pass both tests? So I must restrict the domain and say X better be at least four. You guys cool with that? So let's go through the process. X equals three. Y minus four squared plus two. Okay, let's do PEMDAS in reverse, okay? PEMDAS in reverse. What's the first thing that should go away? Let's move the two. Boom. So can we get rid of the multiply and divide next? What would we do? Let's divide by three. X minus two over three. Okay, we did the adds and subtracts. We did the multiplies and divides. What should we do next? Let's get rid of that exponent. Let's take the square root of both sides. X minus two over three is Y minus four. What's the last little step that I need to do? Add four to both sides. And this is going to be called J inverse of X. Don't leave it as Y. Go ahead and call it J inverse because J was the name of the original. So this is my perfect thing. Okay. Now here's a cool thing about this. In my original problem, let me show you something. The domain of that problem was X had to be at least four. The range was at least two. Look what happens to the domain and range down here. They did, didn't they? What happened is, do you see how X better be at least two? Because if you went below two, wouldn't that actually kill it and make it a negative root? And the smallest answer you can ever get out of a root is zero plus four is four. So if you have done it right, they should switch places. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, now. Let's go ahead and try to do one more little thing here on this. Let's prove it. And uh, I, I do know one of you enough to know that this may be an issue. When you say prove it, you have to be slow. Because what do we know should happen if I put these two things together? What should happen if I took J of J inverse of X? What did we already say it has to be? It has to be what number? Uh-uh. Going back. It better be X. If you put them all together, no matter what I plug in here, if it's a five, a two, or a negative six, it better give me those same numbers back, right? Because you know the answer, does that make you sometimes want to short circuit the process because you know what you're looking for? So if I ask you to prove, please, for goodness sakes, do not short circuit the problem. So this is J of X, but notice I left a gap there. So I took the original function right up here and I put a gap where X used to be because what has to go in that hole? Oh boy, this thing right here. And I, I can't require you guys to use colors, but I would love it if you did to emphasize this is what X used to be, right? 
So um, anybody see anything nice? Oh, the fours are gone. Let's do that. This is what I'm saying. I am not short circuiting the process at all. Now, do you notice anything else that is convenient? The square and the square root. What would happen about the square and the square root? Oh, those would be gone too. I'm gonna to kind of come up to here. So the square and the square root would be gone. What do you see now? The threes are gone. Can you see the answer now? X, woo, I proved it. I know I nailed this problem and I did brilliant work. Okay, do you guys see how that plays out? Okay, on the test, please don't do this. So please, I'm gonna show you something naughty. I'm thinking of you, Karen. It's super tempting to do this because you know the answer already, don't you? So could you find yourself going, well, the four and the four cancel, the square root and the square cancel, the three and the three cancel, this two and that two cancel, so it's X. Yay. Would that be tempting? Did I do good math? Yeah, but I made it completely impossible for anybody else to understand my process. Do you follow that? If you went here, my process, sorry, you missed it. What the, the black stuff that I showed all the way through here, is it clear what I did line by line by line and they actually worked? See so guys, a proof in mathematics, you have to know this, a proof in mathematics is the formal part of math. It's like the tuxedo part of math. When you wear a tuxedo you're, or, or the formal gown, you're gonna be a little more careful with your process, right? You're gonna step a little bit more carefully and make sure everything looks nice and pretty, right? You follow me on that idea? Anytime you see proof, don't do this kind of crap. That's what you do when you're wearing your old paint clothes and you don't care if you get a little bit of mud on them. It's okay, if you're doing it at home and you're like, I wonder if I did that right, let me put this together. Oh yeah, 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 that worked, okay, good. I'm fine with that, but on a test, put on the formal clothes and let's make sure it looks good. All right, so what happens though, and, and I'm, I'm really, really sorry that I, I, I have uh, some activities that you're gonna be working on the next couple of days, um, but for today, I kinda gotta push and get some stuff done. Um, what if though someone gave you this story right here? See, the bummer with that one right there is that is a parabola, correct? But what do you not know right now from how it is phrased to you? I don't have the vertex, do I? So unfortunately, I still know I'm gonna have to cut this up to make it one-to-one -one somehow. So there was a little trick that you learned back in Algebra 2 and Math 2. My students in Math 2 and Mr. Wheeler students, I know for certain in Math 2 did this as well. You start with opposite B over 2A. That was the portion that gives you the vertex. That's where that axis of symmetry lies. Do you guys remember hearing that? It's part of the quadratic formula. So what's opposite B? Opposite 12 over, oh, so the vertex is going to be at negative two. You guys with me so far? Ah, now if I take negative two and I plug it back into the original function, let's see, what happens if I took negative two and I plugged it back into the original function? I got negative 14. Well guys, you know what? I now have what I need. Here's K of X. So what am I gonna have to do to make this thing work? I've got a problem with a vertex of negative two, negative 14. What am I gonna have to do to make this thing invertible? Get rid of one side. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna keep going, but it's really, really important if the problem is not set up for you to see it, make it something that's set up to see it. This vertex form is your friend, okay? Are we doing okay so far? All right, now, here comes, you guys ready for the hard one? I don't think that was that bad, was it? I don't think anything so far has been terrible. Um, but here comes the one that, that, that makes some people kind of like get squeamish. 
Um, 5x minus 1 over 4x plus, uh, let's say, 9. Oh, dear. This is a rational equation, okay? This is a rational. We have studied this equation in here before. And what I know right off the bat is my domain is that x will not be negative 9 fourths, okay? Which means somewhere down here on the inverse, I know that my range is going to be that I can have negative 9 fourths. Now, why do I know that? Well, yeah, well, yes, that's true. But why did I know this becomes this? Because what happens in an inverse is x and y do what? They switch places. That's just what happens every single time. They have to switch places. Okay, so if I have enough time, I actually kind of messed up a little bit. I took a little too long on that front thing, so there's one piece that I'm not going to get to today. I'm, I'll pick it up tomorrow. It's fine. I want to do two of these. I want to do one of them with you and have you do one on your own because this is a hard thing for people to do. I have to get y by itself. That sucks. Look at that. I've got y on top and bottom, and you want me to get it all alone? So there's a simple trick, and you do it works the same way every single time. Can you guys picture this as like an x over 1? Let's cross multiply. Okay, step one, cross multiply. 4xy plus 9x is equal to 5y minus 1. Well, my problem is a little better, isn't it? It's a little better because at least I don't have a fraction. Now I got an xy, that's worse, dang. So here's my next step. You tell me, what did I do on my next step? I put y's on one side and everybody that does not have a y on the other side. So number one, I cross multiplied, that made the fractions go away. Number two, I grouped my y's together. And you know why? Because now I could factor. Ooh, I just factored. You see it? What would be left to now get that new y all by itself since it is being multiplied by 4x minus 5? Divide by 4x minus 5. I made the factor story that I told you we needed. So this is my new inverse would be this guy over this. That's awesome. It worked. Now, let's check something out. What's the new domain of this thing? What can it not be? Five fourths, which means I know my original range. That's kind of cool. See, I don't like doing range. It's not my favorite thing. Range is tricky, but you know what? You see the five fourths right there? It was sitting there. Do you guys see the nine, negative nine four sitting right here? There's little breadcrumbs that will help you do that. I want you to do one of these on your own. We don't have a lot of time. So your problem m of x, I'm going to give you x minus 4 over 2x plus 3. So let's see if you guys can find the inverse of that. And I'm not going to get as far as I wanted to get, but it'll be okay. I kind of knew I was going to leave a few things out today. I just left out a little more than I wanted. Do you want this or do you want this?
All right, step one, cross multiply, right? 2xy plus 3x. What's the next step, everybody? Did I mess up? Oh, thank you. 3x, thank you. What do we do next? Move the y's together. 2xy minus y is negative 3x minus 4. Don't forget to banish all the non-y people. Make them go to the other side. I don't want them. What do we do next? Factor out the y. 2, 2x minus 1. And last but not least, what's the last thing to finish my story? Yay. So this is now my new inverse, which we would call m inverse of x. You guys all right? That should be the antidote, right? So if, if two gave me seven, then seven should give me two. It should flip flop, if you will. Now I've got to do one more thing for you guys in the last literal 30 seconds. Boy, this is going to be big. So I got to do a whole lecture in 30 seconds. Just kidding. So here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. Let's do a new share and see if this will pop up like I wanted to. Please write this down. In your Zoom lecture, in the Zoom lecture on 9-16, I gave a lecture on this idea. You'll see an overlap. You don't need to watch the whole thing. Can you watch the little tiny piece? There's about a five minute thing on what's called parametric equations. But the first couple of questions that are in there are called parametrics. Can you please just watch the first, for part of your homework, I'm giving you this little worksheet to do as much as you can. But please watch that first part of 916's thing on parametrics. It's really pretty simple idea. It'll just, I want to save time because tomorrow I've got a really cool activity that I want you to get started on. And I don't want to rob that because I do actually want you to not sit and passively listen. I want you guys to actually get some stuff done. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. I'll see you guys.